Hey everyone, Matt Donner here, Chief Academic Officer at Pyramind in San Francisco. And I am going to share a little mixing tidbit with everyone today. As you can see on the screen, we're looking at Ableton 9. And uh, I want to be upfront with everyone about two different things. Um, I am a Pro Tools and Logic user by nature. And I'm uh, coming on to the world of Ableton Live, so this is a bit new for me. You'll notice this install on my machine is so brand new that these are the only plugins I have. And these are the only audio effects I don't have. So the value of this for you when you see that, oh my God, he doesn't have all that fancy stuff on his laptop, how can he possibly mix? Well, the answer is easy because it's not about the plugin. It's about what you do with it. So what I'm going to show you today is using these two very, well, let's just go ahead and call them wimpy plugins. I'm going to show you how to make a super fat kick drum with just EQ and compression. And mind you, again, these are kind of wimpy. These are AU plugins. So these are actually Apple plugins that I ported over from Logic because, as I said, naturally a Logic guy. I may end up recreating this tip in Logic also for you Logic users so you can see it. But here's the deal. It's about making sounds fat without necessarily needing to spend a ton of money on plugins. But really, what this tip is about is about knowing which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And in this case, the chicken is the compression and the egg is EQ. Don't ask me why, which one's the chicken or the egg. I don't know. I'm just having fun with the language. It's early in the morning. It's only 1030 and I haven't really had my coffee yet, which is a good idea. I'll have a sip of coffee right now. <sighs> now I'm ready to go. So the trick is, which comes first, dynamics or EQ? And there are two schools of thought here, two different results, both good. One of them is going to be better for you. Now, in Ableton, as you can see in the bottom here, I've just dragged these plugins right onto my kick track here. So this is my kick track. And literally just went to my plugins, audio units, Apple. I found graphic parametric EQ, excuse me, down here. And I found your dynamics processor here. These are extremely limited tools. And that's, again, kind of the point. To give you an idea of how limited a tool it is, one of the things that I generally look for in a compressor, it's like, got to have this, and yet it's not here, is the ability to measure makeup gain. For those of you who don't know too much about dynamics or compressors, I uh, highly encourage you to go check out our book, which is available at amazon.com. explains it in amazingly simple terms. Uh, but the long and short of a dynamics processor takes the loudest sounds, makes them softer. The softest sounds makes them louder. It takes a very wide dynamic range and shrinks it. Well, the trick is you want to shrink it and then move the whole shrunken dynamic up. So you look for things like master gain or makeup gain. You can see I've got a whopping 11 dB here. So that's a huge amount and probably is too much, but I can't tell because I can't see how much compression is being pulled out. I like to see a meter that shows GR or gain reduction. It tells me how much work the compressor is doing. So if the compressor is taking out 6 dB, I put 6 dB back in. If it's taking out 12, I'll put 12 back in if I really want to squeeze it. Well, I don't see that here, so I'm doing my best guess. Uh, but again, the result is still totally workable because the tool still does a fine job of compressing. Now, here on the EQ, I've got this one knob. It's a one-band parametric. And if I click on it, you can see I'm looking at 63 hertz. I'm adding 11 dB of gain. And I've got a fairly wide half an octave bandwidth here. So you can see it's a nice, nice little mountain peak. And if I click here and then click here, it defaults to being 10, which is incredibly narrow. And I could make it super wide by doing like 1. And you can see the difference. So now it's a nice, big, wide mountain. That's really good if you want to do kind of bulk work. You want to add a ton of frequencies into your EQ. I'm just going to stay up the middle and call it 5 for now. So it's just one EQ. I'm boosting, and then I'm sweeping until I like it. Or as we say in the book, you boost, hunt, and kill if I'm turning things down. Well, that's great. I got a compressor. I got an EQ. I got a kick track. I'll let you hear everything kind of before and after. And then I'm going to show you the real thing, which is, again, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. As you see down here on the bottom left, you've got the dynamics. And then you've got the EQ. So in this particular situation, the compression happens first, and the EQ happens second. Now, I tend to work this way. And the reason is I like to really hear the difference in EQ. 
When I compress the sound first, I make I kind of pack it in. You can think of it as literally packing a suitcase. You're kind of sitting on the suitcase and smashing it with a sledgehammer trying to fit everything in. And once you've got everything packed and tight, then you zip it up. That's the compression. Well, the EQ is basically like reaching in and sort of just pulling out a sock out of the suitcase. I just want one sock. In this case, the sock is 63 hertz. That's what I want to pull out. Well, I pack it in first, and then I pull up the frequencies I'm looking for. And since I'm going to be working on a kick drum, low frequency is probably what I want. Now, if I were to reverse these and put the EQ first, it's basically the same as saying, okay, I'm going to really, I'm going to make sure that that sock is available. I'm going to put it at the top of everything I'm packing in the suitcase, and then I'm going to smash it all together and pack it into the suitcase. Well, the thing is, in this case, the sock is still in the suitcase. These 63 hertz, this gain bump of 10 dB, 11 dB that I'm adding, is still packed in this compressor. So the low frequency doesn't, doesn't grow. It doesn't get louder than the rest of the sounds in the compressor. In fact, the compressor actually squishes it in further. So the more low end I boost here, the harder the compressor is working, and ultimately, the less low end I get. And so, in terms of workflow, you've got to kind of make a choice for yourself. Do you want to build your sound and then pack it in nice and tight? Or do you want to tighten your sound and then pull up little bits and pieces that you want to showcase? That's really the difference here. So what we're going to do right now, both plugins are off, uh, nothing soloed. So I'm just going to back the track up. I'm going to let it play for a little bit and give you a sense of what the track is. This was an assignment that uh, Ben Anderson, one of our uh, shining students here at Pyramid, wrote. Um, but this is a homework assignment. I think it's a fine piece of music. What we're going to zoom into is the kick drum. But just to give you an idea, I want you to hear what he's got. Listen carefully for the kick drum. And then we're going to dig in and we're going to solo the kick. And I'm going to show you kind of the before and after. So here it goes. This is called Sonic. So that's kind of the guts of it. So the four on the floor is obviously foundational to the track. It kind of sets the rhythm, sets the groove, sets the whole thing going. And I think he's done a fine job picking a kick, and I think it tucks in pretty nicely. But what we're going to try to do is um, zoom into it and see if we can make it a little more robust so it has its own kind of unique character in the piece. So I'm going to turn on my loop here. And first things first, let's just solo the kick and hear it as it is. So as you can hear, there's a good amount of low rumble. There's a nice mid-frequency slap about it. There's a little bit of noise up top. It's not the cleanest kick drum in the world, but it works. I hear a little distortion in there too. So what I'm going to try to do is round it out. I'm going to try and give it a little more boom, a little more body down low so it can really fill that foundation. And the first thing you would probably choose to do in that environment would be the EQ. So let's put this in front as if we had no Dynamics compressor. We only have an EQ. And let's turn it on. And I'm just going to start with this down at zero. And the way I like to use EQs in this environment, um, a lot of guys will tell you that you should only use subtractive EQ. You should only remove the sounds that you don't like. Don't add the sounds that you do like. I don't always subscribe to that. Uh, I like to do a little of both. So I'm just going to kind of move it around until I think I hear what I'm looking for. And here we go. So as you can hear, it did something cool here at 109. It also did something cool down lower. Let me find it again. 
somewhere between 59 and 64. And your first guess is probably going to be, well, just pick one. Uh, but you don't just pick one. You have to really think about this. Um, I'm not entirely sure I know what key the song is in. I'm going to take a guess that it's in uh, D, D Dorian. And so what I like to do is go here, frequency to pitch. And there's this awesome website I use and tell all of my students to use, and it's this one, the peabody.sap.org slash class slash st2 slash no lab slash note hertz. If it's D, then I should be boosting at 73. You guys all see that? Zoom in. D is 73. If it's C sharp, it's 69. If it's C, it's 65. Maybe it's in the key of C. Let's find out. So we're going to go back over to live, and I'm just going to go in and type in. There we are, 64. So let's just put it at 65. Let's say we're in the key of C. Now, I want to look at the octave above it, which is 131. So let's do an A-B test. Okay. Okay, that's the difference between C in the 65 octave range and C in the 131 octave range. The 131 has a lot more push, more punch. The one at 63 is a lot more boom and depth and resonance. Uh, for this piece, it's kind of a rock piece in a way because it's got the guitar going in there. I think I'm going to leave it at 131 for now. I'll change my mind later. So now that I've EQ'd it, now I'm going to compress it. And listen to what happens. I don't know what you heard, but I heard more high frequency. I heard the stickiness of the kick coming out. Now, if I'm boosting low end and then I compress, why is the high frequency getting stronger? And the reason is the compressor is actually squeezing back more of this 130. So the 130 is actually getting smaller and the whole file is getting louder because I'm adding 11 and a half dB of gain. And I don't even know how much I'm taking out. I'm taking out this red amount. I don't know. I have no idea how much that is. This is not specific. From here to there is 20. I don't know, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15. I don't know, I'm guessing. But because I'm boosting 131, 131 is getting squashed and the high frequency is coming out. So now I'm gonna do a little AB. I've got the EQ first, then the compressor. I'm going to flip it around, do the compressor, and then the EQ. You tell me what you hear more of. Now, I don't know about you. You should rewind that, check it over and over and over again. But to me, when it's compressed first and then EQ'd, that bass move that I made here, I can hear that. It sounds thick and punchy here and a big boom resonance over here. The other way around, it sounds slappier and snappier and has more cut, but it does not have more low end. Now that may be what you want and there are times to do it this way and there are times to do it the other way. So for me, I would almost always compress and then pull out the details of what I want in the EQ afterwards, which is, uh, a little bit weird for people. I don't, I'm not sure why, but some people are used to like EQing the sound and then compressing it. And, and that's great. That works too. But note that if you really want to focus on one particular thing and you really want to push something here, when you compress after, you're probably not going to compress this hard. You'll probably just tighten it up a little bit and know that your EQ is going to change a little bit. So now what we'll do is we'll take it out of solo, we'll get out of loop, go back to the beginning, and let's hear the difference. And I'll sort of turn these on and off while the song is playing.
So there you have it. Make your own conclusions. Feel free to make comments on this posting. I'm pretty sure this is going up to YouTube. Um, if you have any comments, questions, uh, curious about learning more, obviously you can always reach out to us at Pyramind. If you're not sure about like how to EQ or what compression is or how that all works, again, check out the book. Maybe it'll be useful for you, uh, especially if you don't have any kind of like formalized audio training. It's a really uh, incredibly affordable way to kind of learn everything um, there is about audio at the level you might be at. So once again, signing off, Matt Donner, Chief Academic Officer at Pyramine. Um, hope you enjoy this tip, and uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. Very much like to thank Pyramine for hosting me here once again. Um, I think this institution is really cool, and until I came here for the first time, I had never seen anything like it in my whole life. What I think really separates us from other people who teach is that we are outrageously passionate about what we do, and especially in electronic music. Since since coming to Pyramind, I, I've discovered electronic music, and you know, San Francisco being a mecca for underground electronic music opened up so many doors for me and kind of blew my mind. We cover everything from absinthe to contact. When people get to the mind-melting level, uh, we get into modular synthesis. Everything about native instruments, everything about logic synths, down to the, the finest detail. We, we learned it all. The fundamentals of understanding how things work, that's just essential. But then beyond that, there's so much more, and that's where it gets into just a lot of, of the artistic side of like the creative approach of, of why you do something, not just how. There's a lot of schools that just, you know, they focus on the technicality of, of recording music, um, but I wanted something that would foster creativity and, and really helped me develop as an artist as well. Each of our genre-specific programs comes in four levels. There's a basic, an advanced, a professional, and then a master's level. And the master's level is, of course, everything we do. It's the largest and most powerful programs that we can create for you.